So I would like to uh, discuss big data, big databases in the context of uh, individuals, and particularly in the context of a new view of medicine uh, that we've called P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And I'll stress each of those four Ps uh, is really key to what we're thinking about in the future. When I started at uh, Caltech in roughly uh, 1970, I was really impressed with the enormous complexity of both biology and disease. And I realized at that time we didn't have either the tools uh, for dealing with complexity, uh, nor did we have strategies for dealing with it. And as a consequence of that, uh, I had the good fortune to participate over the next uh, 20 or 30 years in four paradigm changes in biology that led to the fifth one, which I call systems medicine and P4 medicine. The first of these paradigm changes was uh, bringing engineering to biology. In my early years at Caltech, we developed a series there of four instruments that allowed us to read and write uh, DNA and proteins. One of them, the automated sequencer made possible the genome project. What was critical about that instrumentation is it gave us big data. And of course, the automated sequencer got me involved with the Human Genome Project uh, in the mid-1980s or so, right at the very beginning. And that was a lesson in realizing how conservative most scientists are. I would say when we began in 86 and 87 talking about the Human Genome Project, probably uh, 80 to 90 percent of the biologists really opposed it. But it went through and it gave us again something from a systems point of view that was essential. Namely, it gave us a complete parts list of human genes and by inferences the proteins as well. The automated sequencer also made me realize how important cross-disciplinary biology was. That is, bringing together all of the different disciplines in a single context so you could develop technologies, strategies, and apply them to leading edge biology. And indeed, it was uh, Bill Gates that allowed me to move from Caltech to the University of Washington uh, to set up the first cross-disciplinary department. And it actually pioneered two of the first critical techniques in proteomics. It wrote the key software for uh, the Human Genome Project. We developed the inkjet technology for synthesizing DNA and a variety of other things. I then resigned from the university, in part because of the constraints of bureaucracies that are honed for the past, but not for the future, uh, to start the first Institute of Systems Biology and to begin thinking about system science and applying that early on to problems of disease. And of course, that led to systems medicine and the P4 medicine as we've talked about here. So to put things in the context of both systems biology and big data, let me say that systems medicine has two really essential features. One, we're going to see that every patient will uh, have generated a virtual cloud of billions of data points of many different types of data, and that these data will be analyzed to optimize, optimize wellness and to minimize disease. And of course, with big data, there are several challenges. One is the signal to noise problem, and that's where an awful lot of people who big data fall down because you need to integrate domain expertise with the big data in a seamless fashion. And I think many of the IT companies of the world in thinking about healthcare have failed in just this regard. The second point is we can reduce enormously the data dimensionality of this virtual cloud by converting it into biological networks that in principle operate at the chromosomal, the molecular, the cellular, 
uh, the organ and even the organismic levels. And of course, these biological networks transmit information, they govern normal development, and they become perturbed in disease. And if indeed you can capture how the disease-perturbed networks actually change from their normal counterparts, you can come to understand in some detail mechanisms of disease and of course, that gives you the insight for being able to think about diagnosis and therapy as well. Now, I think systems medicine has reached an incredible tipping point where we can do things now that are absolutely going to transform medicine. We've used animal models to look at the dynamics of disease to get the earliest insights into disease and where the models or our or orthologous to humans, we can gain fundamental and deep insights. We've used family genome sequencing to identify disease genes. Recently, we did 50 families with bipolar disease and a normal number of controls and have identified a whole series of genes that contribute to this disease that are all related to neurotransmitters. We've looked at a systems approach to blood diagnostics. There again, the question is, how do you separate signal from noise? The diagnostic markers you want are a small fraction of the changes you see between normal and diseased individuals. And using this approach, recently we've developed a 13 protein panel uh, cancer diagnostic, lung cancer diagnostic, that beautifully separates benign nodules from their neoplastic counterparts, and in so doing, at least in the U.S., can save the healthcare system uh, north of $3.5 billion a year. We've been able to stratify diseases into their different subgroups so we can impedance match them uh, against uh, drugs, and we're starting to take on large-scale projects. For example, we've looked at 750 human trios for preterm birth disease, a really fundamental disease of the developing world and, and the developed world as well. And these sequence analyses of mother, father, and infant, coupled with enormous longitudinal information taken from the blood of the mother as the fetus matures, have given us some new, deep, fundamental insights into this disease. So it's big data, it's systems approaches to disease, and it's patient-activated social networks that have come together to create this P4 medicine, again, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And let me just say the patient-activated social networks are absolutely critical, one, for learning what the new medicine is, two, for doing crowdsourcing to learn how to use it, and three, to become advocates for forcing a generally conservative system uh, to accept change in the future. I'll just say that P4 medicine differs from contemporary medicine in really striking ways. It's proactive, it's focused on the individual, it's focused on wellness rather than just disease, it's all about creating these patient data clouds that will let us uh, optimize wellness and minimize disease, and it's extremely skeptical of how clinical trials have been done up to date with large population-based groups that average out the individual uniqueness genetically and environmentally of each one of the individuals in the 30,000 patients that might be included in a cancer trial. Rather, we look at the patients individually and aggregate them subsequently according to the unique attributes that each uh, exhibits. And of course, the patient-activated social networks go without saying. So really, this P4 medicine has two central poles. One is quantifying wellness. The other is demystifying disease. And I'll just make the point that contemporary society focuses all of its resources for the most part, on dealing with disease. Very little is done on the wellness side. And in fact, 
it can have a dubious reputation because of uh, health fads and things like that. But what we propose to do is quantify wellness because that is really the key to optimizing human capital. But as I'll show you, it's also the key to understanding the early events that occur in disease, which we miss completely with contemporary medicine. So my view is this will lead to an emergence of two industries, a wellness industry in the future and a disease industry, which we call the healthcare industry now. And I think the interrelationship between them will become evident. Now, wellness is absolutely necessary because of the aging populations, really in the developed and the developing countries as well, because of this really startling fact. If uh, we, uh, in 10 years or so, continue with the increases we've seen in the uh, average age of individuals, we can extrapolate that as many as 50% as of them or so are going to be uh, living to be of the age of 100 or so, and it means understanding wellness is absolutely going to be the key to the uh, developing world. The other point that I would make is that there is an enormous disease burden uh, that the developing world has with regard to chronic diseases. And of course, this is going to be key to sort out in the future uh, as well. So let's talk about a project where we've really tried to bring systems medicine, uh, big data, and social networks all together in the form of a pilot project where we're proposing to analyze 100,000 well individuals over an extended period of time as a pilot project. The idea is we'll do a complete genome analysis for each, that we'll do uh, clinical analyses, metabolomic analyses, proteomic analyses, we'll do the gut metabolome, we'll measure psychological and uh, high level physiological parameters We'll do the genome once, we'll do the clinical chemistries from bloods and saliva and urines every three months, so we have this repetitive uh, data production. And of course, with the self-actualized uh, measurements, we'll do them uh, continuously. What we'll be able to do if we were to start with 100,000 individuals is in a relatively short period of time look back and divide those populations into two groups. One, a group that remained well or improved in health, and two, a group that transitioned into disease. On the well group, we can begin mining their data for multi-parameter metrics that allow us to measure the fundamental parameters, both psychological and physiological, of what it is to be well, and this absolute quantitative measurement of wellness is absolutely critical because what it's become obvious to us is that in fact all of us have in a sense a wellness well and most of us are near the bottom of that well and with the appropriate data and responses you can be moved up to again maximize your human uh, capital and what we want to do is have good metrics for assessing uh, just where you are in this wellness well. Now, as I said, the second thing we can do is look at this second category of individuals that have transitioned to disease, and we can go back to the data sets that have been generated right at the point of transition. We can use systems approaches to understand the dynamic network changes that occur in those disease-perturbed networks Use that to create therapies that hopefully in the future will move you from the disease to the wellness trajectory early on, saving the healthcare system all of the downstream additional time uh, that you might have been sick. What we're going to do with all of this data is model for each individual the actionable traits that will allow them to uh, improve their wellness and or minimize their disease. 
So the actionable traits clearly come from single types of data. In fact, in the genome, there are somewhere between three and 500 variants, each of which is actionable in interesting ways. But more important, it comes from the integration of many different types of data. We've hired coaches uh, advised by MDs who will take these data for individual patients and go back to the patients and explain what their actionable possibilities are, and even more important, persuade them to act on the actionable possibilities. What we found in the study I'll describe in just a moment is the ability to have a patient change their behavior and three months later see in the chemistry of their cell those changes that correspond to improvements is an enormously positive reinforcing behavior uh, leading to uh, enormously effective uh, responses. So we started this year, and I'll describe that in a moment, with 107 individuals. This next year, we plan to go to 1,000, the following year to 10,000, and then finally to the 100,000 individuals. I'm proposing to Congress that we make this a national US initiative, just as we did with the Genome Project, that will be supported over a long period of time to develop the technologies, the strategies, and the clinical translations that will be necessary uh, for achieving what I've described here. In March of this year, we took 107 individuals and began putting them through exactly the study that I've described. And the results really have been uh, uh, fascinating. So with the early sets of data, the very first clinical data we looked at, as you can see here, there are people that have cardiovascular actionable possibilities, people that have nutritional, people that have inflammatory uh, possibilities, and so forth. And these are people that were selected to be well, so we can see what the nature of that wellness actually is. To give you an example of specific examples that have come about, one individual uh, clearly had hemochromatosis. This is a disease that attacks your pancreas, liver, and ultimately your heart. And usually people, when they present, are already invalids. This individual was caught early and will not go through that progression. Simple uh, bleeding is sufficient to reduce the individual back to normal. We caught one person whose physicians had totally missed the fact that he was quite a severe diabetic. And what was really interesting is we had three people that had off-scale levels of mercury, and upon inquiry, all of them ate a lot of tuna, in some cases, through sushi. All three cut out tuna completely, and within a three-month period, their mercury levels had jumped by, had decreased by 50%, really quite a striking kind of response. Another response, which you might think is typical of Seattle, is that 90 out of 107 individuals actually had relatively low vitamins, uh, vitamin D levels. And of course, this is, uh, makes you susceptible to uh, rickets and um, uh, cardiovascular disease, cognitive diseases, a whole series of things. So what we did then look at was the genomes of these individuals. There are six variants in three genes that actually inhibit the uptake of vitamin D. And what we were able to show beautifully is in the first set that we analyzed, that if you have lots of these bad variants, your vitamin D level in the blue was, rel was lower than if you had an intermediate number or if you had none at all. And the ability to move from those very low levels to high levels was inversely proportional in terms of the vitamin D dose required to the number of bad variants you had. You needed mega doses with multiple variants. You needed much smaller doses with no variants at all. Hence, the combination of the clinical chemistry of your vitamin D level plus your genome to tell you whether you had 
uh, blocking genes for the uptake of vitamin D was absolutely critical in this uh, evaluation. And as you can see from the first to the second tranches, the level of vitamin D in these 107 individuals almost uniformly moved up more toward normal levels with this uh, particular treatment. What was really striking is of the 107 individuals, just by analyzing single types of data initially, everybody had actionable possibilities. There is no such thing as a perfect, uh, perfectly well individual. And of course, these actionable possibilities will change with your environment and change with your time. So what this has done is made virtually all of the participants in this study conscious of the fact that they have to take control of their own health and govern and dictate how they're going to improve uh, their own wellness. What I think was very interesting were the opportunities that emerged from these studies. So one, we really are beginning to introduce P4 medicine to the healthcare system with its ability to improve the quality of healthcare, uh, to decrease the cost, and of course, ultimately to create options for uh, innovation. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. But I think this 100K project has uh, clearly shown us, together with big data, that one, we are going to create a catalog of these actionable possibilities that'll transform how we can optimize wellness in larger populations. Number two, we'll have the analytics software to be able to analyze each individual and prioritize their actionable possibilities to, again, optimize wellness and minimize disease. Number three, we can use the parameters of the well to create a multi-dimensional uh, parameter for wellness that will allow us, I think, to capture both psychological as well as physiologic factors of wellness. Number four, we're clearly going to be able to see transitions from wellness to disease and come to understand how those early events can be manipulated to move people back into a wellness category. And finally, this is going to drive the development of critical technologies for making all of these measurements. And I'm going to talk about the globalization of healthcare. I think what's really critical for that is eventually, in a five to 10 year period, we drive essentially all the assays uh, to the smartphone so that we can do these things at home, have them then be reported in for, uh, for analysis. Um, so what about P4 medicine and how this project is going to change uh, society? Uh, I would argue that it will do so in a whole variety of ways. First, it's going to lead, as I indicated earlier, to a digitalization of medicine. And I think that digitalization of medicine is going to be the key to pushing this kind of wellness and dealing with disease uh, to a global fashion. In the early 90s, who would have ever guessed that the digitalization of communications and the cell phone would allow uh, a woman in a rural village in India to make a living for her family? I think that is exactly the kind of change we're going to see in healthcare over the next uh, five to 10 years. The database we're generating of the 1,000 individuals is going to be an enormous source of innovation for spinning off companies that will be in this newly emerging wellness industry. And I think it offers a unique opportunity to institutions that adopt this uh, type of strategy for innovation in the future. My view is that the healthcare industry, uh, or th as I called it, the disease industry, will be dwarfed by the wellness industry in a 10 to 15 year period. And we're now creating the companies that will be the Googles and Microsoft of wellness. Again, an opportunity for creating wellness. 
What is interesting about making companies scientifically um, competitive is the development of new technologies that lead to striking transformations. We call these macro inventions. The steam engine was a macro invention that led to many micro inventions. And of course, the, the, uh, the development of the industrialized world. I'd argue that P4 medicine is a macro invention that's going to lead to an enormous number of micro inventions as we explode to an industry that is wellness and the wellness to disease transition industries of the future. I think we'll be able to use wellness to optimize human capital. Uh, there are trillions of dollars lost to society because of sickness uh, in terms of jobs uh, each year. And those losses fall in two categories, people that are sick and absent People that go to work sick and don't function. That's called presenteeism. And frankly, presenteeism counts for 82% of the loss in wages. And I think we can optimize human capital through optimizing wellness and your wellness well. And, and finally, I think the contemporary medicine is never going to turn around the cost of health care. I think what is really required to do that is the individual taking responsibility for themselves for their own health. And I think that is exactly what this study has demonstrated that we can do in the future. So in closing, I would argue both consumer wellness and the digitalization of healthcare are really going to help to democratize the type of healthcare I've talked about here, wellness, and disease transitions. Thank you very much.